Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Andrew Smith. Uh, I'm the uh, co-chair of the Data Sciences Smart Cities and uh, providing this welcome on behalf of myself and uh, my co-chair, uh, Fred Jang, who's also uh, on the line. Um, so this is uh, one of our uh, seminars in the Data for Good seminar series and which we invite leading academics from around the world uh, to share how they use data to address societal challenges. Uh, we're very, very pleased today uh, to welcome Professor John Taylor from uh, Georgia Tech. Or I, I know him as JT, but uh, I'll, I'll try to stay formal. Um, so I've known um, JT for, for many years. He actually joined our faculty at Columbia, uh, having uh, gotten his PhD uh, from Stanford uh, University. Uh, he stayed at Columbia for a number of years and then was recruited away from us uh, by uh, Virginia Tech, where he went on to become a Dean's Faculty Fellow uh, of the College of Engineering, as well as a Fellow of the College of Architecture and Urban Studies. Uh, he then moved on uh, to Georgia Tech and he's now the uh, Frederick Law Olmsted Professor at Georgia Tech in the School of Civil Engineering, uh, Civil and Environmental Engineering. And JT's research uh, focuses at the interface, I would say, of sort of human social dynamics and infrastructure. So how those things uh, react. And so we're really, really pleased uh, to, to have him. I, I don't wanna say come back, unfortunately, this is, this is still virtual, uh, but come back and, and give us uh, a seminar at Columbia <clears throat> uh, in Smart City uh, Digital Twin. So with that, I will turn it over to, to you. Thanks, right. JT. Thanks, Andrew, for the kind introduction. Um, my opening comment is that I wish I was there in person. So I, I, I had thought about demurring and saying, oh, I can't make it. Uh, maybe I can wait and come when I can come in person because I love coming to Columbia and visiting campus and friends there. Um, so uh, I'll have to come back, Fred, and I have an NSF project together. So Fred, I'm inviting myself in the spring to come for a visit. Uh, but, but thank you, uh, Andrew, for the introduction. Thank you everyone for coming. Uh, I'm going to tell the story of Smart City Digital Twins in, in three parts today. Uh, so the first part will be, how did we arrive at the paradigm of Smart City Digital Twins? And what was our what was the background of my lab that, that got us there? Uh, leading up to defining what, what is a Smart City Digital Twin. Uh, and then we work a lot with the city of Atlanta. Uh, and there are five strategic thrusts uh, for smart cities in Atlanta. And I'm gonna give some examples of Smart City Digital Twin related uh, work we're doing in each of those five thrust areas as kind of the, the middle uh, explaining what Smart City Digital Twin uh, is part of the presentation. Uh, and then I'll finish with something uh, a bit more detailed. And so we are doing uh, a Smart City Digital Twin implementation and have been for a few years with the city of Columbus, Georgia, which is um, uh, the second largest city uh, in Georgia. So I'll give some details about uh, what we're doing there. So let me go ahead and get started. So as I said, um, I'll start off with uh, sort of the, the background and my point, point of origin in all of this is, is studying uh, buildings, uh, in particular uh, uh, activities that were underway, uh, let's say a decade or so ago to make the models, the information models that represent buildings more in, intelligent. Uh, and so when I when I launched uh, my lab, even at uh, when I was at Columbia, uh, we had the the mission to examine, model, and try and improve the bigger uh, changes that are occurring, uh, as Andrew said, uh, with the focus on uh, phenomena at the human and engineered network uh, interface. And so uh, we got started out um, really looking at how. Um, uh, uh, infrastructure can and should be adapted to support inter-organizational communication. So these models were becoming increasingly intelligent, uh, but uh, it was difficult for companies to actually work together around the creation of these models and ultimately the use of those models for fabrication and construction. There was at the time a NIST report that described it as an over $15 billion problem, uh, issues of uh, poor interoperability, uh, both in the, the technical capacity of the information, but also the, the organizational collaboration. So 
Uh, with that as a starting point, we, we got to understand these building information models uh, really, really well uh, in terms of how they um, might better support collaboration. And so uh, we had then the idea to make the model, the models themselves a collaboration environment. So, uh, you know, rather than companies sharing a model uh, back and forth or uh, concurrently real time working on the model together, uh, could we take the model and make it a collaboration environment itself? So we brought architect, uh, engineers, contractor, and owners into the model uh, with some additional affordances for collaboration. So this is a Boeing delivery center building in Washington state. A Boeing delivery center is about what it sounds like when you buy a jet from Boeing, you have to pick it up from somewhere. Uh, and so you pick it up from this uh, sort of mini airport. This is the virtual version of the airport and we were able to bring those uh, stakeholders into the model uh, with these affordances for basically sharing files, chatting uh, and uh, voting on things. This is what the building ultimately ended up looking like um, compared to the virtual model. Sorry, the photographs aren't great. And one of the things that was interesting is these three screens that they had on the wall in the virtual model, uh, we used those to um, share 2D information. So when the uh, architect was trying to explain something to the contractor walking through the model, they could walk up uh, to this screen and actually pull up the plans and, and have a look and have a discussion around that. We are still doing some work at the single building level on this. This is the Candida Building for Innovative Sustainable Design. It is a, um, a living building on campus, one of only 20 something, I believe, certified living buildings uh, in the world, which is a very rigorous uh, sustainability standard. And what we were interested with this was to give, um, oops, my screen just went blank, uh, to give uh, stakeholders the opportunity to actually interface uh, with the model while it was still being designed. And so we brought the the architect into the model, for example, uh, she was looking around inside, uh, and this is with a full immersion uh, headset on, an Oculus Rift headset. Uh, she noticed that the, the ceiling braces, as you can see up there in the view, were black. And she said, no, they're supposed to be uh, this gray color. And we were able to change that while she was in the model. And she just sort of froze and said, well, this changes everything. I can actually stand in the building I'm designing uh, and design it. Uh, but our interest was in collecting uh, stakeholder input. And so being researchers, we also wanted to see what's the best way to collect that. Uh, and so this is a 360 view model of that same building where you drop into a specific place and you can pivot holding your phone or your iPad as if you're in the model. You can view what people have posted in the model in terms of feedback, and you can actually uh, put feedback into the model your, yourself. So here they're going to go to another spot in the model, have a look around, and then they're going to uh, just basically tap the screen on the iPad, and then they give, the, give them the option to put in a comment of their own. And so we use this to collect information on the seven petals of the living building standard. This uh, third animation was one that we thought would be the best for stakeholder input, and it is an augmented reality model. So it's uh, similar to the other two, but you can go out and actually walk into the building. Uh, it's a GPS based. So unfortunately, the construction fencing was up when we did this animation, so you couldn't walk in. But you, if you walked into the building, you would enter uh, the model physically right where it is, is being constructed there in the background. And so we've, we've brought in uh, the stakeholders, the, basically in this case, the faculty, staff, students, and community members who um, would have, a, have an interest in, in the model's final construction, but also the actual people doing the work, the architect, engineer, contractor, and the owner purchasing it. Um, and we realized in these uh, various buildings, we've done many more buildings than these couple, uh, that it was really a globally distributed mix of interdisciplinary teams that came to work on these models. Uh, and so we thought, why not bring that into a pedagogical environment? And uh, we created, uh, with some money from the National Science Foundation, the CyberGrid, which is cyber-enabled global research infrastructure for design. 
these are the various universities that have been involved. Uh, and so for the global aspect of it, you have uh, the Indian Institute of Technology, Madras, Bozici University in Turkey, uh, Twente University in the Netherlands, the Helsinki University of Technology in Finland. And you may recognize this uh, logo uh, at the bottom. This, this project was actually started when I was um, a faculty member at Columbia. So this, this course was, was uh, also taught uh, at Columbia before I, I moved on. And so having put various uh, stakeholders, basically all the stakeholders we could think up uh, into the model, uh, we still wanted to continue forward with research uh, and so had the idea, what if, what if the model weren't just something that was used for uh, design and construction? What if the model was, was, had a useful life uh, after the building was built? And so we, we uh, did what we could to uh, basically, in this case, uh, hack a, a Revit model to get real-time uh, energy data into the model and to use the model as a, as a sort of uh, feedback. Uh, mechanism. And so you can see uh, sort of quickly and intuitively, uh, relatively speaking in terms of per square foot energy use intensity, if the color is more red, then it's using a higher uh, amount of energy than a room that say, for example, is more green. And so we were interested in to what extent could this be used as a, a form of feedback but this is really, I think, where the, the digital twin journey started because in, in, in a kind of very modest sense, we're creating a twin of, of the building's energy use in, in the virtual environment. Uh, that, that is actually, uh, that floor plan that you just saw is uh, a, a Columbia University dormitory. This is a picture of it from the outside us installing ammeters in the basement of the building and a kind of more rudimentary uh, information system. Uh, we did find that when users were exposed to energy uh, uh, information about their use, if they received just information about their own use, it didn't have much of an effect on their consumption. But if they um, um, saw not just their energy use, but the energy use of um, their friends in the building, that peer network uh, effect uh, resulted in uh, significant reductions in energy consumption. It was a short study period, but 26% reduction uh, over the uh, study period. We were curious to what extent does this organizational network, um, uh, what we learned about uh, people's friendship networks in a building, how would that apply in an organizational or business setting? So we did a, a similar project at the Denver Alliance for Sustainability, uh, where we um, gave some occupants of the building uh, their own energy use information uh, and another study group in the building, the energy use of others in their um, uh, organizational uh, peer group, right? So people that were uh, in the same working group with them and created this uh, information to share that. Uh, and this was a longer study, a three month study with hundred participants. Uh, we had a lower percentage reduction, but again, uh, individuals that only got their energy use uh, didn't uh, change, at least significantly change their energy consumption, but those that saw the energy consumption of others in their group did. So we saw an, uh, an important effect there occurring at not just the uh, engineered uh, infrastructure, but where the human networks also couple together with that. And to end this, uh, this bit of background, uh, we were beginning to study how social media data might play a role. We'd been, we'd been examining, um, uh, trying to understand how people actually make decisions to change their energy consumption. And so we started to collect social media data to study that better. Uh, and we happened to start collecting this just before Hurricane, Hurricane Sandy struck uh, uh, New York City. Uh, and we're able to apply that, that same data to understand how mobility patterns were actually impacted because the social media data also contained geotagging, uh, how that affected people's movement patterns uh, following the uh, Hurricane Sandy to see kind of how resilient were those movement patterns. And so with that kind of last study, uh, we uh, started to evolve the, the mission of the lab. And this is what it's been, let's say, for about the last five years. So not just studying big changes at the human and engineered network interface, 
but studying that um, at and across scales. So, so not just buildings, but neighborhoods of buildings, communities up to the city scale, uh, even in, in some cases, which I'll present to the scale of the, the state. All of this to achieve smart, sustainable, resilient, and livable cities. And so there's a logic that we had inside the lab uh, but what, you know, if we, if we wanted uh, to be motivated uh, beyond just our kind of interests, what, what, is there a reason to, to study uh, beyond the building scale? Uh, on the left is an image of Manhattan, uh, well, image, uh, artist's interpretation from 1609, and then this is what it looked like 400 years later. Um, well, if the United Nations is right in their predictions that um, uh, world populations are moving into cities, and that 70% will be in cities by 2050, then that's a 2.5 billion uh, increase, which would mean what took 400 years or more uh, to create uh, 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 Manhattan or to urbanize Manhattan, we would need to urbanize 1.5 million people per week or a new New York City uh, every other month, which is kind of astounding to contemplate. And so um, from, a, from a pure impact standpoint, we were convinced to study at this uh, greater scale. Uh, but what about uh, uh, scientifically speaking, are there interesting dynamics at the human and engineered network interface? Well, if we look at how uh, population scaling affects socioeconomic activities, uh, research has shown that um, it scales super linearly with population. And so if we double the population in, in the city, we don't just get double the income, wealth, and innovation, but there's a super linear effect where we'll get 15% uh, more uh, than double. Uh, but by the same token, uh, socioeconomically speaking, uh, there's also a super linear effect with crime, pollution, and disease. Uh, so we're gonna get uh, more than double uh, as the population doubles of crime, pollution, and disease. Conversely, if we look at the physical infrastructure, then it scales uh, sublinearly. Uh, and so uh, if we double the population in the city, we don't need twice as much uh, infrastructure, uh, but we need, um, according to this study, about 15% less than, than uh, double. And so there are interesting uh, interactions that are occurring there, interesting dynamics at the human and engineered network interface, which um, kind of encourages us to, to do studies in this area. And so I'll just share two that kind of bring us up in terms of studying human dynamics separately from infrastructure um, uh, network dynamics. Uh, and then I'll describe what is exactly this, this digital twin. Uh, and so I mentioned that we were starting to collect social media data to understand energy conservation practice sharing. And in this case, we are disconnecting it. So all of the studies, we always have this uh, dependent variable to understand what effect does it have on performance, whether it's the, the design performance, if we're talking about the design examples, or if we're doing building energy experiments, what effect does it have on energy consumption? Uh, but we relaxed the need to uh, connect uh, to a specific uh, energy consumption uh, reduction and instead just looked at communications in general so that we could study a much larger, larger base of data. Uh, and decided to do a 30-day period uh, to look at all social media postings related to energy saving practices. Uh, at the time we collected the data, there were about 110,000 communications. And we used that to kind of understand, you know, why one uh, energy saving practice might, might flow uh, pretty far across the network, whereas others might um, basically uh, separate off from others and be in a closed loop. Uh, and so we also looked at specifically um, opinion leaders, uh, the general public and organizations as um, uh, entities that are promoting the diffusion of concepts and looked at which uh, had, a, had a greater impact on the flow of a practice through the network. So interesting things to learn if we're talking about purely the human networks. Uh, if we start to think about infrastructure as a network, as I'd said, we were very much focused on single buildings if we study this building, um, the control building, uh, and we're interested in predicting the amount of energy it's going to consume and use Energy Plus for that, let's say, uh, that, may, um, that simulation may change if we consider the context in which the building is, is sitting. And so this is a, a real block uh, in New York State um, 
uh, where the buildings were, it's a quasi urban block, buildings are very close together. Uh, and so you can imagine, you can even see the mutual shading that will occur, the effect it would have on um, uh, convection. Uh, so that would affect the energy use of the control building by the other buildings that surround it. And so to examine that, uh, we actually took that same uh, group of buildings and we placed them in the hottest and the coldest uh, cities in the United States just to see kind of the extremes of what the effect may be. When we placed uh, that block in Miami, uh, the uh, considering the buildings around it led to modeling inaccuracies of 58% uh, in the summer in Miami um, and 32% in the winter, uh, which is uh, uh, substantial uh, differences. Uh, so if we start to think of infrastructure uh, it, in terms of networks as opposed to individual buildings, there's also uh, something interesting to, to learn. And so now let me get into uh, Smart City Digital Twins. Um, so this, with all this as background context, right? So where, where, did the, where did my research come from and how did we start to expand it up to the urban scale? I uh, became aware of this book that Ivan As Isaac Asimov uh, had, um, had done. Uh, and it is based on a series of postcards that were created for the um, World Exposition in Paris in 1900. Uh, and the postcards were developed to, with um, artists and intellectuals to think through what the world might be like in 100 years time. Uh, and he, in the book, looks at, um, uh, uh, kind of assesses how good of a job they did at predicting the future. And here are just some of the, the examples uh, from the book that you could walk up to a stand and jump into a, a, a flying taxi. Uh, that uh, firemen would be would be uh, on wings flying up to uh, save babies and to put out fires, and that professors would be able to drop a book into a machine, grind it up, and it would go into the student's head. And so that was at a time of the second industrial revolution. Uh, I'm, where we are now is proliferation of IoT data about infrastructure. And so we created this um, NSF workshop uh, in 2017, uh, really to think through if we if we take the lead from Isaac Asimov, if we um, you know uh, do something similar to what was done in 1900, what kind of a future could we uh, uh, dream up? It was called Science Fiction to Smart Cities, and I know some in the room will recognize some of these people. That's Jane Tuckman uh, in the center and uh, Patricia Culligan uh, behind her. Uh, to people that have an association with Columbia, but myself and Sybil Darable organized this uh, NSF workshop uh, just basically to think through, uh, you know, if we think differently, how could future cities be be very different? And so this idea of smart city digital twins really really came out uh, of that of that effort. <clears throat> and so a digital twin is pairing of virtual and physical worlds that allows analysis of data, monitoring of systems uh, in order to head off problems before they occur. Uh, and one interesting part of a digital twin is the ability to plan for the future using kind of what if uh, simulations. Digital twins have been around for, for a while. This definition is from a Forbes article. Uh, what we wondered in 2017 was, um, could such a thing be useful in the context of a city? And so if we take this image, this, uh, this is the photograph of the city of Atlanta. Uh, this is the Bank of America building, the tallest building in the city here. Um, could we collect data from the various IoT uh, devices in the city that are, that are flowing? And we have a partnership with the city of Atlanta so that they you know, are able to access that data. And could we uh, store and represent that data in a virtual uh, version of the city? And so we define this idea of a smart city digital twin as a, a smart IoT enabled data rich platform of a city that can be used to replicate and simulate uh, changes at the human infrastructure interface with the goal of improving resilience, sustainability and livability in the real city. And so we kind of laid out in that paper uh, four things that would be of, of interest in escalating difficulty. At the first level, a smart city digital twin would, would enable you to understand just what's, what's happening. So we're, we're collecting all this information. We're seeing perhaps um, uh, intersections between different uh, types of data. 
uh, we can use those data flows to understand what's happening in the city. Uh, as we move to the next level, which is where I think uh, of the smart city digital twinning uh, efforts that I'm, I'm aware of, many of them are focused on this. So, so why? Why is it happening? So using the smart city digital twin to understand you know, uh, why we're seeing uh, increased traffic in, in this area, given other data flows that we might have uh, uh, in that area. Uh, the third level and the level that um, people are, are definitely working in uh, is uh, scenarios, right? So given our current real-time status and understanding of the data in the system, what if uh, there was a fire? Uh, in one of these buildings, um, could we could we use the data that we've collected thus far to understand and predict, um, you know, how we might uh, effectively evacuate people from that building? Uh, and then at the fourth level are interventions, and the idea here, uh, and I haven't seen much much of this, is, you know, are there ways that a smart uh, city digital twin could act on the behalf of its citizens? So a small example also related to the, the fire is a preemptive signalization, right? So when, a, when the, the fire truck is approaching the uh, traffic signal, it goes to green for the fire truck. And so here the infrastructure is making it easier for the, the truck to get to the fire in the critical minutes, first minutes after a fire when you need to evacuate uh, people from the building. So we have uh, seen uh, industry analyst reports that are that are predicting that 500 cities would have uh, smart city digital twins by 2025, which seems uh, like a very large number in a very short period of time. And uh, another article earlier this year in Forbes just talking about how digital twins are going to change uh, the way we understand and live in and work in cities. So with that, as a as a kind of leading up to smart city digital twins uh, and what is a smart city digital twin. Uh, I thought I would give some examples in the five uh, strategic uh, thrust areas of smart city in the city of Atlanta. Uh, these are environmental sustainability, city operational efficiency, public and business engagement, mobility and public safety. And so I have one or two examples in each and then I'll uh, give the more detailed combined example where we try and really do all five of those in, in one project in, in Columbus, Georgia. Okay, so in the area of environmental sustainability, uh, I mentioned the, the, the class that we did involving universities from around the world where they were working on a single building. Uh, we, we, we have created a virtual version of the city of Atlanta and wondered why not do, why not put the students into the virtual version of the city uh, to take the class? Uh, Georgia Tech uh, recently purchased the Biltmore Hotel, which is this building uh, in the circle here. Uh, and it's a historic building and they were interested in ways to improve the energy efficiency of the building. And so we brought in students from, from that uh, list of universities that I showed earlier. Uh, to participate in an energy efficiency retrofit and analysis of the building. And so this is one of the, the student projects here, a small scale version. Here are the students represented as avatars and they're presenting their results on these, these screens. But you can also see that they're working right there uh, in the city. So uh, basically bringing, bringing the students into the virtual environment. Uh, now an example more related to energy consumption, uh, we were able to get access to smart meter data for many of the buildings on campus at Georgia Tech, and we sit right in midtown uh, Atlanta. It's not quite as urbanized as the Columbia area, but uh, definitely in an urban area of the city. And we, we took a benchmarking approach, which is typically used for understanding annual energy consumption and benchmarking buildings. Uh, and tried to bring it back to that near real-time um, uh, uh, level, given that we have smart meter data on energy consumption across many of the buildings. <clears throat> and we found some interesting things. There are some buildings that were for strategic time periods, in this case, we're talking about summer, uh, consistently using more energy than predicted. Hold on a second. Uh, some other buildings that were consistently using less energy than predicted. 
and other buildings that had kind of erratic uh, uh, issues uh, in terms of whether they were using more or less energy than, than other buildings of similar type on campus. Uh, and so we're, we're using this information to help the facilities management uh, group figure out uh, when is a building maybe need a change in operational schedules, uh, if it's erratic and people are coming outside of the predicted hours, or where might it need a um, capital expenditure to improve something that is causing it to consistently uh, uh, underperform. Uh, taking that same uh, data on the, the building energy consumption and doing an example here of city operational efficiency, uh, the facilities management staff can go into the virtual version uh, of, in this case, the campus, or it could be the city, uh, and actually visually compare, just like the example of the, the Columbia dormitory, but instead of comparing uh, energy use by, by rooms, here they're comparing uh, entire building energy use for similar buildings. So they can kind of uh, quickly see this red building is using uh, relatively uh, much more energy than it should be. Uh, compared to the, the green buildings, let's say. And on the right are our facility analytics, uh, data analytics director, and one of the facility managers um, entering into that virtual uh, environment. Now, um, what this is, is, is neat. It's very neat to go in and, and see the energy use and the sliding scale you can choose whenever you want to, um, to see, change the time period and the, and the rate. I'm still uh, very interested in getting this information out in front of uh, more people, right? So not just the facilities management staff, but uh, public engagement in this case, public and business engagement. And so again, taking that same uh, data, but having it represented differently, we created an app um, which could go in front of faculty, staff, and students where you hold your iPhone up. And as you get near a building, a bubble comes up and it tells you how much energy that building is using per square foot, but it's also color coded so you'll know um, whether or not that building is performing uh, well uh, relative to other buildings of a similar type. You see the College of Computing a little red there, uh, as well as the Petite building. Um, but, but with this, we can get uh, the app in front of students and get them interested in understanding the energy profile of buildings on campus. And so if you were to click on uh, the building, you could see uh, the energy supply and consumption of that building, but you can also select from a drop down uh, and identify any building on campus where we have the smart meter data and see where, what kind of uh, uh, sources are, are supplying the energy for the building because we have a goal of increased uh, renewable. So you can see how that building's doing. Uh, in terms of its energy supply, but also in terms of energy consumption um, relative to um, uh, the goal for the building and the goal for the campus, how is any individual uh, building uh, doing on the campus? So this was a, an effort to integrate um, more of the general public into information about energy. Now I switch to mobility, which is the, the fourth of the uh, strategic thrust areas of smart city in Atlanta. And here is, uh, you're seeing the blue dots appearing. Our positional records uh, in greater London over, over a period of a year. Actually, I don't think what is in this uh, visualization is the whole year, uh, but there were 19 million roughly positional records we collected. Uh, and we also collected information from um, uh, gas and electricity uh, meters and looked at the city in terms of lower super output areas and middle uh, super output areas to see, uh, well, what is, what is the scale of analysis that will allow us to correlate movement patterns in the city with energy consumption, uh, but also uh, to, to think through some ideas on how people's mobility in the city might create opportunities for diffusion of, of energy efficiency uh, innovations. That's Greater London mobility in the United States. Uh, there's good publicly available energy use uh, for uh, the city of Chicago. So in this case, we're now looking at diurnal patterns. So you see people aggregating into the center of the city in Chicago uh, and then sort of dispersing um, in, in the period of a 24 hour period. It's cycling uh, different 24 hour periods on the left. 
And on the right, the energy use intensity. And so we were interested in does, does energy use follow people's mobility patterns? And uh, perhaps not surprisingly, we did, we did find a correlation in those uh, spatiotemporal fluctuations. Uh, finally, uh, studying mobility in the city of Atlanta, we have not been successful at getting um, good energy data beyond the campus, uh, but we can collect positional records of um, people's movement patterns. And if anyone on this um, seminar has been to Atlanta, you know Atlanta suffers from, from bad traffic. And so we're interested in how the movement patterns are actually shifting over time. And so on the right is just uh, a shift in those mobility patterns over a over a couple year period of time. Uh, but during the course of this study, we had a sort of a sensational change in mobility patterns, and that is the I-85 uh, bridge collapse, uh, which was a pathway into the city for a very large number of computers, not computers, commuters. Uh, and so we were able to expand that study, which I'll, I'll, I'll touch on in just a moment uh, with the Georgia Department of Transportation. <laughs> And so the, the last of the, the thrusts is um, public safety. Uh, again, look, using geotag social media, we're interested in uh, the human system response to earthquakes. Uh, and these T1, T10, T100, T1000 is the center of gravity of the um, postings about the earthquake in the moments following the earthquake, one being one minute, 10 being 10 minutes, uh, and so on. So you, interestingly, the, um, uh, the center of these is pretty far from the earthquake itself. The earthquake was in Pawnee, Oklahoma, uh, and this area is actually Oklahoma City. Uh, and the uh, social media postings that occurred would have been before people would have been able to, to feel the earthquake. Uh, we were um, interested in carrying that uh, a bit forward. And so what you see on the screen here, the Roman numerals are the, um, the MMI, the modified Mercalli intensity, which is um, the, the felt intensity of an earthquake uh, with uh, a higher Roman numeral being higher. And this is a Napa Valley earthquake, so seven being the highest uh, MMI in the area. Now, again, we're correlating uh, the, um, the locations of uh, social media postings but we're also now looking at the sentiment uh, of the social media posting. So we're the degree of, of negative intensity of the posting versus the, the actual felt intensity of the earthquake. And um, perhaps not surprisingly, we found uh, a correlation between these. And so we uh, proposed to the National Science Foundation to use the, you know, what we learned from these couple of uh, earthquake studies to develop a system that, that could actually be useful to emergency responders. And so if we're taking in uh, geotag social media through our streaming API, uh, we can uh, examine uh, what is being said. Uh, so for semantic relativeness, you know, where, where are people talking about the same thing uh, and in close proximity to each other in order to identify potential uh, uh, topics for uh, emergencies within a larger emergency. Uh, and then when we look at those specific uh, candidate emergencies, uh, we look at how the, in, the sentiment, uh, how negative it is, and how, um, how much that uh, intensity of negative sentiment is actually increasing or becoming more negative in order to identify those uh, areas that might be of particular interest to emergency responders. And so in the left here, you see this is um, Hurricane Harvey. And the honeycomb pattern is just a, a convention we use to, to break, break down the, the area of Greater Houston. And the cells that have a darker red are ones that have a higher uh, intensity of negative social media postings uh, and a higher number. And so if you were to click into one of those, uh, in this case, there were eight postings intensely negative regarding evacuation at a hospital and another uh, couple here on flooding that was occurring uh, on this roadway system. And so we are uh, now working with, uh, or have been for a few years, working with the Georgia Department of Transportation uh, to take these ideas that were explored on the NSF project and see if we can't develop something for the state highway system to identify uh, issues that are occurring on the highway system um, more quickly than by 
by other means. So they were particularly concerned something like the I-85 bridge collapse, which is a, not a common at all type of event, but the need to get there quickly before uh, there's people are harmed or there's loss of life. And so in this case, we're actually combining information from social media postings, but also community postings. So this also couples in uh, data from ways. And so this ties us back to that I-85 bridge collapse uh, project. So with those um, kind of uh, specific examples in those five areas, I wanted to kind of, uh, finish up with the last portion on an ongoing project we have with the city of Columbus, Georgia. As I mentioned, Columbus is the, the second largest uh, city in the state um, by population. Uh, we received public-private partnership funding to work with them on this, uh, something called a Smart Communities Challenge Award. Uh, and so the way those work, uh, we, we did in, uh, announce our intent to do something related to smart city digital twinning, but of course, how you apply that could be done in a hundred different ways. And so the goal was to actually work with the local leaders uh, to, to develop a vision uh, for um, that uh, area of the city to become smart. This is the, the group of uh, individuals that came together for those initial sessions to basically uh, lay out what are the possibilities and what are the local leaders. So we're working with the mayor, the city manager, the director of IT and all of the IT staff, uh, the Uptown Business Leaders Association to just think through what would be beneficial with the goal being to deploy something uh, uh, they thought sensor-based and some analytical methods that would improve the city um, and then implement that uh, solution to serve the uh, citizens of the city of Columbus. Uh, this is what the city looks like. It sits on a river. Uh, interestingly, if you ever come to Georgia, uh, the river here has Cat 5 rapids in it. So if you're into kayaking or whitewater rafting, uh, you can, you can uh, basically launch right uh, in the downtown or the uptown of the city. And it's located here uh, in the southish um, west of the state. And we, uh, for the project, after going through various rounds of um, envisioning with the, the leaders, uh, decided to do something related to um, uh, heat stress, which I'll, I'll describe in the next slide. And so we were interested in a sensor that could give good detail on what's happening in the, basically the environment, so uh, ambient air quality. Um, and what's happening with the foot traffic in the city. So what are the street conditions? And so we chose a array of things, sensor, uh, multi-sensor node developed by Argonne National Labs and University of Chicago, uh, which we um, procured and put uh, installed on a couple of the um, traffic signal posts at, at a couple of the intersections. And so our idea was to integrate the array of things data um, and the video data that we're collecting with a digital twin model of the city. And so interestingly, in this case, we developed the digital twin with the city because the IT staff was involved and because they would own it when it was complete, we worked with them to <coughs> develop the virtual version of the city. Um, and so because they were involved, it's a lot more lifelike perhaps than we might've done with regards to the lampposts and the trees and all that. Uh, but these are the couple of intersections uh, so they're near uh, the 10th Street intersection, and they're able with the virtual reality headset to pull up a uh, heads up display in the virtual environment and actually look at, in this case, they're looking at uh, temperature and humidity over time. And there's a slider scale, which I think he or she is about to slide, which you know change the, changes the date that you're looking at. Uh, once you have a date selected on the left of that heads up display, you can also look at specific uh, concentrations of carbon monoxide, hydrogen sulfide, um, nitrogen dioxide, and other uh, air quality uh, contaminants. Uh, so we, we couple in the data from the array of things uh, and from the video data with the digital twin model. Uh, next, we apply object detection, detection and tracking uh, using computer vision algorithms. So on the bottom right uh, here, we're using uh, deep sort combined with YOLO or you only look once version three. Uh, algorithm to, to count, in this case, pedestrians, but uh, to count pedestrians and cars and to, to see uh, the tracing of their, you know, where they're going. 
And so we, we're, we've sensed uh, pedestrian vehicular traffic, and then we want to simulate and predict uh, community dynamics that are occurring in the uptown area, uh, and ideally get to a what if scenario where we can do some, some forecasting. Uh, we decided to work with, um, uh, well, we were working with the, the city, but the city has an issue of heat stress. And this was, this was in August when we were collecting the data when it was particularly hot. Uh, here's just an alert from the Columbus Office of Homeland Security about extreme heat. And here's the mayor uh, talking about how to be safe when it's extremely hot like this. And so uh, we, we wanted to provide something to the city managers, IT staff, and so on. Uh, to, to understand, you know, when are the, the levels getting to a point where it, it would be useful to do an intervention. I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment. And so we created a weighted um, temperature humidity index that weights not just the temperature and the humidity, uh, but also uh, the, the number of people that are passing through. And here you see a, a significant spike at the 11th Street uh, intersection. And as it happened, there was a Black Lives Matter protest that was going through that area, which caused the spike. And so we, we were talking with them, well, what if a crowded event like a protest were to be planned? Uh, can we make um, citizen-centric and data-informed decisions about the placement of, for example, uh, public awareness campaigns or cooling centers? Uh, and so here is, um, in this smaller model, the, the forecasting model uh, evaluation for the 10th Street intersection. This uh, blue line is the prediction, um, uh, what the model predicted would happen in the next 24 hours, and the rougher looking purple line is what would actually uh, uh, happened over that uh, 24 hour period. Uh, and then on the left is um, our uh, week of training of information. The black dots are actual data points. The blue line is now the prediction day by day. Um, sorry, the actual data day by day. Here is the forecast prediction um, using Facebook's time series forecasting procedure. Uh, and the, the, blue, the blue range is the upper and lower confidence bounds. And so we're, we're wanting to you know, predict uh, forward a bit in time in order to determine if we were going to put any pop-up cooling centers. And, and when, I, when I Googled around about uh, pop-up cooling centers, uh, New York City came up, uh, and so there are there are such things. Um, probably not right now, uh, but across uh, Manhattan, this is right uh, adjacent to Central Park on the Upper West Side. And so, trying to help the city with this to do a better job of doing targeted uh, public awareness campaigns where the most people would be and the most people would be potentially in hazard, um, and also providing access to water, not just drinking, but the cooling misting um, uh, at the locations that would, would make the most sense, which may, may change over time. And so where we are now, this is really a project in process. I'm happy to talk about the, the river safety aspect if there's time. Um, <clears throat> but we are uh, helping them understand, first and foremost, how people move through the uptown area. So that's that um, what is happening in a city. At a second level, remember, uh, the second level of a smart city digital twin is why is it happening? So we're helping them to understand with this um, weighted temperature humidity index, the heat exposure risk. And so what are the impacts of the climate, air quality and crowding on that risk in the uptown area of the city, which is a, is a shopping area of the city and a new hotel has been built up. And so it, it's, a, it's a bit crowded. At the third level, we deployed the digital twin of uptown and provide them with tools and resources uh, and it, for businesses, government, and the public. And so this is um, that sort of scenario uh, analysis that we're talking about. And finally, we haven't done uh, the intervention level, but we do believe this more hyper-local data would help the CCG as Columbus Consolidated Government uh, anticipate and proactively address potential problems, starting with the temp weighted uh, temperature humidity index but we're doing something that's a little bit closer to um, life-threatening uh, with river safety. So coming back to this, this image uh, from uh, Asimov's books, um, how good of a job did they do at predicting? Well, of course, many of us have the Roomba probably at home now uh, doing our vacuuming for us. So we have achieved the mechanical uh, cleaner uh, 
firemen aren't themselves uh, necessarily flying up with wings, uh, but we are using drones as uh, a way to combat fires. Uh, professors aren't dropping books into a machine and grinding and putting into students' heads, but uh, Jill Watson is an artificial intelligence teaching assistant at Georgia Tech uh, that teach it, is a TA along with uh, human TAs and has won some awards for her work. And AeroCabs, the drone taxis are delivering people in Dubai. So a fair job of predicting. Uh, that first NSF workshop, Science Fiction to Smart Cities, was about envisioning. Uh, we held another workshop funded by NSF in 2019. Uh, Columbia was um, one of the um, leads uh, in the workshop. Uh, it was Patricia Culligan who's here um, uh, for Columbia University. But in this case, not just uh, envisioning what the future might be, but very specifically, if we have a shared uh, vision, which is uh, Smart City Digital Twins, what is the research agenda um, what, what needs to be done in order to create smart city digital twins in a way that will lead to the sustainable, uh, livable, and resilient cities we hope for. And so uh, just coming back to the, again, to the highest level, if we're going to have 500 uh, smart city digital twins uh, by 2025 in 500 different cities, which uh, may be a, an ambitious number, but we need research because we still have a fairly limited understanding of smart city digital twins, particularly uh, when they cross infrastructure systems. But if we're going to see the kind of urbanized growth uh, that the UN is predicting, we really need to do so. And so we're hoping uh, that through this, this effort, we can foster a new paradigm of smart city digital twins uh, and really start to think about that um, as a new form of infrastructure that can foster these goals. Uh, and I'll just uh, mention one point. Um, we just had published this year, I guess, edited a special collection on how to engineer smarter cities with smart city digital twins that is published by the ASCE Journal of Management Engineering. So if you go to that link or just Google it, if you're interested in a range of different topics, um, you can you can find, find those there. So I wanna thank, uh, a lot of people I presented, I'm sure, may feel like drinking from a fire hose a bit, a lot of the research of our lab, but there are a lot of collaborators, and this is my current group, and you can see the, I'm sure you're in similar situation, current conditions, everyone with masks out on a hike through Piedmont Park. Uh, also, all that work couldn't be done without funding, so thanks to the, the sponsors, and thank you all for listening for so long. I can stop now and, and uh, take a drink of coffee and answer questions. So uh, thank you, JT, for the fantastic talk. Uh, we have time for a few questions. Uh, if you want to ask a question, uh, feel free to type it in the chat window, uh, and uh, I will go through uh, these questions in, in order. Uh, so we have a question from Jin Mahan. Uh, the question is, uh, well, thank you for the insightful talk. Um, you mentioned the projection of urban population increase by 2050. Uh, and much of that is in uh, cities with rapid development uh, and less smart infrastructure, such as uh, cities in the global south or rural towns with underfunded infrastructure. Uh, so in what ways can digital twin concepts be adapted to uh, these areas? Uh, would reliance on social media for crowdsourced data or drones aerial imagery help in these cases? Uh. So for, for social media data, um, the, um, what, this is not my research, right? So now I'm commenting on what I saw an MIT professor uh, presenting about some, some research in, in uh, different uh, cities in Africa without a lot of IT infrastructure that people did have uh, cell phones and actually were, was able to use the data on uh, cell phone usage to actually uh, understand, you, you know, even though they were dirt roads, what are what are what are the pathways of infrastructure? And so, where I don't doubt that there will be a digital divide um, with regards to the use of cell phones. Uh, what what I understood uh, again from that presentation, we aren't doing research in this area. Uh, there 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 is a lot a lot more people than one might think uh, using um, uh, cell phones and social media applications. As far as um, taking an, an impoverished city and thinking about all of the 
uh, IT infrastructure in particular, I'm thinking the sensors that may have to be in place for some of these things to, um, to be implemented. Uh, I agree that that's a challenge. I, I don't know that we are far enough along in um, um, wealthier cities uh, to, to really know what the future is going to hold. But, but what I do hope is that as we, as we start to collect data from cities that do have the sensors, uh, we learn ways to do that more economically uh, so that these can be more equitably distributed uh, to other cities uh, around the world that may not have the funds to, to develop the kinds of IoT infrastructure to support. So for example, if you, if you go to Chicago, which is where the Array of Things sensors uh, were developed by Argonne and University of Chicago, you'll find AOTs uh, uh, all over the place, uh, many, many of them. Uh, but it may be once you learn what you can learn from those sensors, which are very densely uh, packed in uh, the city of Chicago, you could get similar benefits from a, a deployment of many fewer. So in our case, we we're learning a lot from two, having learned from uh, what they learned from deploying many more. So I, I know it's not an exact answer to your question, but hopefully it provides a little hope. Thank you. Uh, there's another question from Rasika. Uh, I think it's a three-part question. Uh, so first of all, a very insightful talk, especially love the setup. Uh, and uh, curious to know what kinds of systems are intended to be implemented in the case of intervention. Uh, and the second question is, how is data privacy uh, being maintained? Uh, and third, how closely is movement of people associated with energy consumption of specific buildings? All right, um, I may have to ask the other questions back, but the first one was, um, uh, sorry. So the first one is, uh, what kind of systems are intended to be implemented ah, for, uh, for in intervention? Uh, well, I can ask the question back to you. That, that would be more of a, the subject for a brainstorming session. Some, some ideas that um, uh, we have discussed uh, in our laboratory are um, uh, if you take um, an area of the city where it's important that there be um, uh, lights at night uh, to keep people safe, if one of those lights were to go out, um, the, the two nearest on either side might increase the intensity of light in order to accommodate the fact that one has gone out. So that would be an example of the infrastructure itself making a change in how it deploys its, its resource to benefit um, the citizens. The other, uh, the preemptive uh, signalization of the fire trucks. So the, the fire trucks have a device on them. Uh, if they have a device on them that as they approach um, traffic signals, it is green in the direction they're heading, then they can get to the, the fire more quickly in the critical first minutes when um, you have to evacuate people from the building. Would be a, a couple of examples we've, we've discussed Great. And the second part is uh, how is data privacy uh, being maintained, especially in case of mobility? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. The the data sources that that we are using are are sources where people are voluntarily offering uh, information about their location. So um, I think when you get into right in in ways people are are sharing their their location information and sharing information about what they're observing on the, the highway system. And <clears throat> at least we are only using social media sources <clears throat> where people are, are publicly posting, right? So that they aren't, they aren't posting just to go to a, say a friendship network or an in-group, uh, but they are uh, specifically uh, posting publicly. And so we, for all of these studies, go through um, institutional review board uh, approval process and and that is viewed as you know a, a voluntary assertion so um, okay to analyze that data unfortunately you can probably learn uh, a lot more from that data than people think um, and so then it comes down to the um, kind of the moral fiber of the research group that's that's using the lab right so you could you can understand probably where people work uh, where they live uh, where they frequent, whether they're supposed to frequent there or not. Um, so, so there, there are certainly um, still data privacy concerns, uh, but, but we have um, 
not run into any data source that you know would would um, create concerns at least for our institutional review board about us us using. Great. And the uh, third part is uh, how closely is the movement of people associated with energy consumption of buildings? Uh, is it what's the correlation or or a physical location? Uh, I, I assume the question is asking uh, whether uh, where people are would be a good indicator of, of or are maybe uh, whether you can estimate energy consumption of buildings from from people movements. If you have a, a large enough number, and you know, you you might have assumed it would be the case that as people move from the suburbs into the center of the city, uh, that more of the energy consumption the energy consumption profile would shift from more the suburbs of Chicago in the case of the study that I presented to the um, to the downtown buildings where people are are there for work. It's, it's certainly one of the uh, concerns about working from home from a sustainability standpoint is if people are at home, then everyone's like uh, self heating and cooling, uh, which if everyone's in a, in a tall building or in a shared floor, you can do that more efficiently. And so it could actually uh, have some negative um, uh, impacts on sustainability. Uh, great, I think that's all the questions and we are, uh almost out of time. So uh, with that, I want to thank JT again for the wonderful talk and also thank you all for coming to this, uh, this uh, talk. Uh, and uh, thank you for the questions as well. Uh, so Andrew, do you want to say something? No, the same again, just wanted to thank uh, JT for a wonderful presentation. Really appreciate him uh, coming and to thank all of you for, for attending. Yeah, if I can add my thanks as well, and my email address should be still up there on the screen. If you had further questions or, or wanted to drill down deeper on the questions that were asked, feel free to reach out. I'm happy to have the conversation. It was great seeing, I saw uh, George Diodatis uh, video appeared for a second. So great to see uh, some, some friends there uh, at Columbia beyond uh, Fred and Andrew. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye.